right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to gather together as your church. God, into worship like I have heard worship go to you today. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. And we thank you for the worship that has come from the hearts of true worshipers. And teach those, Lord, who have not yet discovered what it is to truly worship. Teach them to worship. Teach them to bow in your presence. Teach them to become hungry and thirsty for your things. And Lord, we ask this all in the name of Jesus. And we ask also, God, that you would speak through me today your words of hope and help and wisdom and strength and power and all of the things, God, that you wish to impart to your people according to our various needs. God, only you can do it. We look to you. We turn to you. We thank you, God. We praise you when it comes, and we know that it will. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody agreed said amen. amen. In the book of Judges, and this just came to me uh, after I postponed the worship team, uh, and said, not yet. And then Judges chapter 7 came to me from the Lord, and it goes along with some other things he'd been putting in my heart this morning. I just couldn't make sense of it until just now. Judges chapter 7. Starts out in the first verse where we read, Jerubal, that is Gideon, and everyone who was with him got up early. And camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many people for me to hand the Midianites over to you, or else Israel might brag. Now that doesn't, we're going to pause there just for that. That doesn't really make sense to us as, as in our human way of thinking. You have too many people in your army, for there to be a victory over the other army. And that just, it seems like we should have more than them, and then that, that's going to help us to win. It seems like we need more guns, we need more horses, we need more chariots, we need more tanks, planes, whatever we're fighting with. If we have more, if we have better, if we have the best, if we have state of the art, then, then we can win. We have a better chance of winning. But, but just like the Lord knew for Israel at this point when he said, unless Israel might brag, Israel might boast in their horses and their chariots. The United States might boast in their weaponry and their ships and their tanks and their, and their fighter jets and such. And, and, and we might boast, the United States might boast in their money and in their position in the world. The United States might brag because uh, they have been uh, for many years a predominantly Christian nation, and we might brag thinking that we've got the best country in the, on the face of the planet and everybody needs to come here and wants to come here. But God said, unless, he said to Gideon, unless the Israel might brag, you got too many people. So we're going to whittle this thing down a little bit. And Lee, he's going to get it to the place where there is no mistake that God did this. He's going to get it to the place where you can't, you can't take credit. You can't uh, assert yourself. You can't say it's because of this or such and such, what I did or what my people did. God brings you to the place where you have to say and you are face to face with the reality that it was God and only God. And I believe that's where we are in the United States of America right now. If this nation is to be saved, if there is to be anything salvaged of what once was a Christian nation, where most of the people in it were bold and confident and proclaimed the gospel in their everyday lives, where this once took place, it's going to have to come down to the place where we are stripped of all of our devices all of our crutches, all of our, the things that we said were things that we needed and that even once we boast, boasted that God provided them for us and maybe at one time He did provide them for us, but we began to trust in them was the problem. You see, God provided medicine 
for the children of Israel. And years later, even Jesus said, the sick need a physician. And he, so God provided a physician for us. He provided medicine for us. He provided a pathway for us for healing in many instances. Aside from those which were strictly related to sin, and he wanted to deal with sin before he dealt with the physical. But he provided those things for us. But the problem has become that we've begun to trust in it. Put our faith in it and them. Put our confidence in that and that alone. And prayer has been relegated to something as a last resort. Let me say to you church this morning that prayer has got to make its way back up to the top of your list. And God loves you enough to make sure that that happens. Now we can all say amen and agree to that and think that's a good thing. God, make make sure that prayer comes back to the top of my list. But do we know what we're asking for when we ask for God to make sure prayer comes to the top of my list? Either all of my methods have been stripped away, have been taken away, have been lost, or made unavailable to me, or they've all been tried. And they've all failed. Anybody ever been in that place before? I've tried it all and it's all failed. It just seems to be something doctors can't fix, money can't fix, procedure can't fix, friends can't fix. Even the church has lost its ability to help me in this situation. Has it come down to we just have God and God alone I'm reminded of when our kids were little and we we taught them a little bit we you know let them believe a little bit about you know Santa Claus and jingle bells and stuff like that but we always made sure that they understood that that stuff was just fluff and stuff and that it that it meant absolutely nothing but what the real reason for Christmas was, and we, we taught them, and of course you guys know this, you've, you've, you could teach it and have. And they were with one of their cousins one day, and their cousin said to, to Deb and I later on, or to his parents actually, and we got word of it, and they, he, he, their cousin said, I feel sorry for April and Travis. And his mama said, baby, why do you feel sorry for April and Travis? And he said, because... All they, all they have is God at Christmas time. All they have is God. They don't have the Santa and the reindeers and the things and all the stuff. Now, not that we don't celebrate what God did and what He gave. And we celebrate right there with you. I mean, it's like, but we know what we're celebrating and we talk about what we're celebrating and why we're celebrating. And all I've got is God. Don't feel sorry for me, Bubba. If, if the doctors can't help me, if the money can't help me, if the stuff and the things can't help me and I'm left flat-footed in my, with my toes in the mud and, and a big knot on my head, don't feel sorry for me if all I've got is God. Because when it's all stripped away, as we heard Jesse sing, when it's all gone, when it's all been said, when it's all been done, when it's all over with, and all I've got is God, all I've got is Jesus, all I have is the sacrifice that was made by Him for me. I've got everything I need. And however He chooses to bring it to me is a good thing. Can anybody agree with what I'm telling you here? The faster you agree, the faster I get done. Because if you ain't agreeing, I'm thinking you ain't getting it. And it's my job that you get it. Somebody says, it's your job finished reading what you started reading too, Pastor. So here we go. So God said, you got too many people. You, you, you got too much stuff you're depending on. You, you, you're going to say you did this. Now, announce in the presence of the people, whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the people turned back, but 10,000 remained. So they had like 32,000 people. I'm thinking we need 32,000 people because you've seen the number in that army over there. 32,000 is good. But no, 22,000 are gone now. We're left with 10. And then the Lord said to Gideon, and now Gideon was hoping, I'm sure, to hear, all right, that's good, 10,000, that's good. You got less than them, but, but, but 10,000. 
Then the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And if I say to you, this one can go with you, then he can go. But if I say about anyone, this one cannot go with you, he cannot go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, separate everyone who laps water with his tongue like a dog and do the same with everyone who kneels to drink. Separate them. And the number of those who lapped with their hands to their mouths was 300 men. And all the rest of the people knelt to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and, and the hand of the Midianites and I will hand the Midianites over to you. But everyone else is to go home. So Gideon sent all the Israelites to their tents, but he kept the 300 who took the people's provisions and their trumpets and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. God will bring you down to 300. Whatever that 300 is for you, it might be alone in the valley. It might be your friends have left you. It might be you've been made fun of and mocked and labeled as an outcast or as a, 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 a relic or as a, an extremist, or whatever they might label you, God will bring you down to 300. But be encouraged, church, that when He does, when He does strip away from you all of the things that you thought you needed, all of the things that maybe you trusted in, and, and, and maybe more than you needed to trust in, that when He strips you from those things, or those things from you, that there is a plan and a purpose that He has in mind that He wants to show not only you, but those around you, and specifically your enemy, that He is God. And that He is God not only of you and of your family and as of me and my house, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, but He is God over this entire planet and everything that it involves. Though our politicians may think they're in charge of it, they haven't a clue as to who is in charge of it among hands of them, don't. Though some of our people and our wise men in this nation think they've got things figured out, they haven't a clue as to what God has done and what God is doing and what God is going to do in the future. Now, as it pertains to the future, God has given me permission to share something with you that He just showed me last night. I waited and I waited and I waited and I toiled with this this morning. I even told Debbie and I, I didn't tell her what it was He said. I said, Lord, hadn't given me permission to say it yet. And I don't know that I'll get it today before I preach, but I got it. Somewhere around 2.30 in the morning this morning, I woke up from a dream. And it was a very short dream, but it was a very powerful dream. And I, you need to hear this. You need to get this. Some of you are going to believe it. Some of you are going to reject it. And it doesn't, it, to, to me, it doesn't necessarily matter what you do, except if you reject it, I'm concerned for you. And I pray for you. But it is, it is very impactful as the way I received it from the Lord. And I'm going to tell you just exactly how He gave it to me so that I don't attempt to add anything to it or take anything away from it. In the dream, I was coming down to the church here, this church. Deb and I were. And, and as we were coming down the, the, the ridge back here, uh, it seemed like we left our vehicles and, 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 we, and we were like hovering above and we could see everything below. We could see the houses and we could see the people and we could see all the things that everybody was doing. And it was normal, everyday life, going about our business as normal and as is usual. But unfortunately, that was going about our business was God was not necessarily a part of it. We were, we were making money and we were doing things and we were having fun and we, it was just, we were just being people just like people are. And, and, and not hardly anybody was concerned with the things of the gospel. Very few that I saw, if any, were, were concerned about the harvest and about the time that we live in that are, are treacherous times and, and times when God's word is under attack and God's people are under attack. But, but people were satisfied, even the Christians were satisfied that I could see. They were satisfied to just be um, kind of blend in and not rock the boat. 
I'm still a Christian, but I'm not necessarily saying too much to these people because it will, it will hurt me or cause me some kind of grief or they'll, you know, say I have something to say. And if they don't want to hear it, then why would I offer it anyway? You know, so we're just kind of blending in, just kind of going along rather than being like a John the Baptist or an Elijah or somebody like that that's not afraid to rock the boat. And so that was what I saw as I came down, as, as we came down. And as we got to the field over here, Hinton's Field, just in front of the church, as we got to the field, I heard a, a, a voice. It was like a voice that was on the radio. And it would be a familiar voice to some of you who've ever listened to like talk radio 99.7 is what I thought actually. Uh, but, but it was a familiar voice. And the voice came on the radio and was making a very important announcement for everybody to hear. You need to hear this. This just happened type thing. Uh, this, this just in news type thing that came, came across the news. And the man said, they have begun a great reset and you will remember this day for the rest of your lives. So something had changed, and I don't know what it was, and I don't know what the man meant by great reset, but, but something had changed uh, drastically in our nation. And, and it had happened in a moment or in a day, in a very short period of time, something drastic had taken place. And, and I, I looked to Debbie and I talked to her. I was talking to her about it after I heard this. And I said, I just heard this over the radio. I said, this is serious. God is doing something here. I don't know exactly what, but people's lives are going to change drastically. And that was the end of the dream. And I woke up from that and I prayed about it, Josh. And I, 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 I lay there in the bed and I prayed about it and I thought maybe the Lord would let me stay there because the air conditioner was blowing really cold and, it was, and I was warm under the covers. But he didn't let me stay. And, and, he, and he told me to get up. So I got up and I went in. The, I walked all the way to the living room, four feet <laughs> in, in our little camper trailer. And I knelt there at my chair and I began to pray. And I began to ask God and question Him and, and wait for Him to speak to me uh, more about this dream. And I said, Lord, if you, if you want me to share this in the morning, you're going to have to confirm it to me. And confirm it, he did. Confirm it, he did. As soon as I walked in the door, I started talking to different ones and different things that were said were lining up with and matching what I had heard in that dream. And so I knew that I was to share this with you. And this goes along with what we're talking about here in Judges and in some other scriptures that I'm thinking of uh, even now where we as a nation have been lulled to sleep by our media. And I'm not trying to you know, down people or things or anything like that, but we've been, we've been so comfortable. We've been so at ease. We've been lulled to sleep and we have, it seems at times, and I see a few of you back there nodding, you know what I'm talking about, you're in agreement with you and some of you are going, hmm, I don't know, he's going to start stepping on my toes, it's time for me to check out. But we have been, we have been so lulled to sleep by our media and by, by the promotion of self in this nation. And, and, and we were talking about that a little bit earlier, uh, Brother Mark, the promotion of self, selfishness and self-centeredness has just taken this nation, it seemed like, over for the most part. And most people are so into themselves and so into their stuff and so into what they have and what they want and what they want to have that we don't have time for the gospel. We don't have time to sit down and teach our children. We don't have time to take to, to, to take a one-on-one -on -one and spend a few hours with somebody who's hungry or thirsty. Oh, we give them a little nugget here and a little nugget there and say, well, come to the church. And, and that's good. I ain't telling you don't, don't invite people to church, but, but don't let this be your ministry. And, that, and that's as far as it goes and as far as you reach out to people is to say, come to church. No, you tell them come to church, but you tell them come to church after you have lived a Christ-like example in front of them. You tell them come to church after something you have said that has challenged them to the point that maybe they got mad at you, that maybe they don't like you, 
that maybe they stay away from you. You've challenged them to the point because this, we're talking about Jesus on the inside of you, right? And Jesus went about just only trying to make friends and make people happy, right? Wrong. You whitewashed tomb, brood of vipers. A grave full of dead bones, stinking flesh, nasty rascals. If he was from the south, he probably would have called them that. Oh, he must have been North Israel. I don't know. Man. But no, no, it's not, it's, not about, it's not about that. It's not about making friends and people happy and trying to stay out of, I hear people talk about this, Facebook jail, whatever that is. Trying to stay out of that because you said something Jesus-like. No, it's about, if, hey, if you want to put me in jail, put me in jail. Because there's people that need to be talked to in there too. If you want to kick me out of this club, kick me out of this club. There's another club that needs to Jesus too. I've, I've jesus all you people to death, apparently. So somebody else maybe want to hear. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody hungry, right? Maybe somebody thirsty. Maybe somebody that's going to be separated from the other group that's going to be the group that will preach the gospel no matter what. Is this too hard? Is this too intense? Are you one of those that says, go on home, you ain't ready to fight. Go on home, yeah, I, I can't use you. But you, you radical, you thirsty, you a little bit crazy, extreme, always doing something about the gospel, always, always talking to somebody, hungry for worship. You turn everything into a sermon. All I got to do is name a movie or a song and you turn it into a sermon. You're the one I need. You're the one I need. Lord, give me 300, just 300 against however many tens of thousands. It's okay. Because if you're there, we've got all we need. Lord, and what's coming in this earth to this nation that is going to change our lives radically and whatever it is that you're talking about when you're talking about a reset, whatever it is, God, that's coming, I don't know what it is. He didn't tell me that. He might later on. He might not ever. But whatever it is that's coming, Lord, you prepare me for it. You're preparing my heart for it. You will lead me. You'll wake me up in the night and you'll speak to me. You'll talk to me over breakfast. You'll talk to me riding a horse. You'll talk to me whatever it is I'm doing. You're going to get your word to me. You're going to get your message to me. You're going to speak to me and I will be ready. I will be prepared and I will spend my life trying to make sure that you are ready and are prepared. And I'm praying and hoping that you'll catch a little bit of this fire that I got shut up in my bones right now. I'm praying and hoping you'll catch a little bit of it and you'll make it your life mission and you'll make it your passion to deny the flesh and everything that is the flesh and everything that the flesh wants and desires and seeks after and say, I'll follow you. I will come after you. I will be the one who built on a solid foundation that is Jesus Christ. I will be the one that on judgment day, I will stand before you and you won't be saying, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And I said, but Lord, I went to Jesus Reigns Church. Lord, I was the pastor. Lord, I heard him preach. Lord, I was the song leader. Lord, didn't I, didn't I play KJOJ? No, that's in Texas. What is it here? K Love, K -Love didn't I pay, play KLOV? Or however they, I don't know. I'm not to got off on a tangent here. Didn't I play the radio? Didn't I listen to the songs? Didn't I tap my foot to it and say, ooh, that's a good song by Third Day or whoever it is? And he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. How is that possible? Did we cast out demons? Did we heal the sick? Now, what spirit was it you did that with? He might say. How did you bypass my holiness? To get to, to this place where you thought you were in church and you thought everything was okay, go on home. Buddy dude's getting intense again, and I don't care. I, don't, I, I, I mean, I care, but I don't care, if that makes sense. Depart from me.
it was for yourself, like Brother Howard Pittman said that the Lord told him about his righteousness, an elder in the church, and it was a stench before the Lord, his righteousness, because it came from self, it came from self-actions and self-activities and churchy stuff and religious stuff, the stuff that needs to go, Brother Mark, and what needs to come is true holiness and God's righteousness and a changed life and a changed heart and one that is so changed, so radically changed, so different that when you look at them, they don't want for themselves anymore. They don't care for those things anymore. Their hunger and their thirst is for the righteousness that can only come from Him. They're not consumed with sports. They're not consumed with seeing that their kid excel in soccer to the point that they get completely out of church doing it. They're not consumed with having the money or the dollars. They're not consumed with talking about this and having the party and having the people and all the stuff. It doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is am I ready? Am I prepared? Am I pursuing the things of a holy God? And does my neighbor know? And have I spent enough time with them? And have I shared this gospel with them? And have I told them that your stance on, on being good is not good? Have I shared that with them? I heard something a few months ago that is so true. And it's such a good way of putting it, the way, the way people think of Christianity nowadays. They said, you know, back in the Bible, in the book of Acts, the people who had just been preached the gospel to, the thousands, cried out, what must we do to be saved? They heard the gospel. They got invited to church. But their cry was, what must I do to be saved? Teach me. Show me. I will learn. I will obey. I will conform. I, not to this world, but to His holiness and His standard. What must I do to be saved? But people, people's cry of today when presented the gospel and when, 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 when come to the church and, and fill our coffee cups and visit and talk and, and have a form of godliness and zero power, Instead of what must I do to be saved, it's what can I do and still be saved? How far can I push the limit? Can I still do this? Is that okay? He is a God of mercy. There's lots of grace. His grace covers all my sin. The work was done for me at Calvary. I have nothing left to do. What can I do and still make it? Can I, can I just get in by the skin of my teeth? No, if that's your attitude, you ain't getting in. And I'm, I'm happy to be able to be the one to tell you. If your attitude is, I want to do what I can and still get in, you ain't getting in. But if your attitude is, I love you, Lord, with all of my heart. And I would sacrifice it all. I would give it all. I would cast it all out. And turn and walk away from it and never look back. If that is your heart, you're on the right foundation. You're on the right path. You will not hear the words, depart from me, you who work iniquity. I didn't know you. You will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. You will hear those words. You took what I gave you, like, like the parable of the talents. You took what I gave you and you multiplied it. What's your gift? What's your calling? What is the thing that God uses you in? Are you using that gift and are you multiplying that gift? And are you getting fruit over here and getting fruit over there from, 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 the, from the, the fruit of your labors, from the results of your prayers? And do you spend time on your knees anymore? Or is that a thing for the church anymore? 
that we get on our knees, that we get on our face, that we cry out to God. I'm not going to ask you to try to remember or recall the last time you spent 30 minutes on your face crying out to God and asking Him to reveal Himself to you and to cleanse you and to purge you and to line you up with His perfect will and to, to, to put you in a place where you're hungry and thirsty for His holiness and you see it and you begin, you, you can't stop. I'm not going to ask you for the last time that happened. Maybe our prayers have been relegated to if we say the prayer over a meal. Mm -mm. No church, it's going to take more than that. And it may take more than this sermon to open your eyes and your heart to see. But at least a seed has been planted. It may take more than just a friend telling you, hey, you know, that kind of life that you're living, God's not pleased with that. Do we tell our friends that anymore? Is that a thing that we, that we tell our friends? God is not pleased with the lifestyle you're living you're living in sin? Is that a thing we say anymore? Probably not if, if the majority of our young people don't even believe in hell anymore, and that is a legitimate statistic. I forget now what the percentage is, if they know exactly. Don't believe in the devil, don't believe in hell. We've just preached the devil right out of the church, except he's still alive and well. We just don't talk about him anymore. No, but it will take this sermon, another sermon. It'll take one of you getting on board. It'll take 10 of you. It'll take 300 of you getting on board. And for God then to show up and do what he does by the power of his spirit, that He'll change hearts, that He'll change lives, that He'll bring conviction. Let me tell you, revival does not look like we met here at 7 o'clock for three nights in a row and, and one-third of the, 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 the population of the church managed to show up at least one night. That's not what revival looks like. Revival looks like it's swept across this, this congregation and there is conviction and there is heart change and there is habit change and there is life change. And when your old friends that knew you pre-revival see you, they look at you funny and they say, what in the world happened to you? You're different. You've changed. If you've never had one of your old friends look at you and say, Shannon, you've changed. Maybe you haven't. Ouch. And maybe we need to. And maybe it's the reset God's talking about. Maybe He's about to, Brother Ken, start this flame that will burn through this nation and through little churches everywhere and through big churches everywhere. And it will burn out all of the chaff, all of the stuff that presented itself as godly but was really selfish. And the, and the churches that are full of good people that are lost and going to hell, sitting in church, and there's plenty of them, will get changed drastically. We'll get radically saved. And you won't have to beg people to come to church anymore. I have, in my almost 30 years of pastoring now, had to say to people who say, I want to come hold a revival at your church. I've had to say, and, and I don't, don't take this too personal unless it's personal. But I've had to say, we can't get nobody to come. They won't come. They will, we'll have a revival and 10 people will show up. We'll have a guest speaker come on a night other than, you know, our regular times. And, and 10 people will get here. That's about how many hungry people we got. 332,000. Yep, that's about right. But, but God. It's going to make a change. It's going to be a reset. I don't know what exactly it's going to look like. I've already said that. I don't know exactly when it's going to be. I've already said that. But there's going to be a reset. And there's going to be hungry people. And there's going to be thirsty people. And there's going to be scared people. 
And there's going to be people crying out instead of what can I still do or do and still be saved? They're going to be crying out, what must I do? Tell me about what's going on with you. Tell me about how this change took place in you. I'm hungry for His righteousness. Pray for the day that we get there. Lord, bring it soon. Because we got a world that's in a world of hurt. And they're lost and they think they're found. I'm going to ask somebody to come up here to the platform, play a little music if they could, if they will. And I'm going to give an altar call. Now, we heard a message last week from our brother Brandon that brought you to a place to say, I want to dedicate my life. Hopefully, you've heard a message today that's brought you to a place to say, I want to give my life. It's not mine anymore. I want to give it all to Him. I've heard what you said, preacher, and I need it. I need that kind of change. I need that kind of reality in my walk. I'm tired of playing. I'm tired of it being about me. I'm tired of it being about my comfort. I'm tired of it being just church as usual, business as usual. I come to church and I'm not moved. And I just sing a song and I, I, don't, I don't weep. My heart's not stirred. I hear a sermon and I'm more critical of it than anything else rather than critiqued by it. You need revival. You need change. And if, you, if you're the first one up and you come to this altar and everybody looking at you and they know, uh-oh, Travis needs revival. He's our worship leader. He needs revival. Well, yeah. Who doesn't? Why are you still sitting there? Who doesn't? And besides, they wouldn't be looking at you saying that anyway. They'd be looking at you thinking, man, they got stirred by the Spirit and I feel something in me that's stirring too. I need it. I need it. Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of true worship. I'm coming back to, I want to lay it all at your feet, God. I can't do this anymore. It's empty. There's nothing there. It's a form and no power. God, we need your power. God, we need your change. Start with me. Start with me. And I'm telling you, church, I prayed that prayer this morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. God, start with me. Start with me. Before I can ever preach this message to your people, God, you start with me. Because as far as they need to go, I need to go. Because as far as your neighbor needs to go, you need to go. As much as they need Him and Him more in them, you need Him. It's just a matter of whether or not you'll say yes. And many have already come and the altar is full. If you want to come and join them, kneel behind them, that's good. If you want to kneel where you are, that's okay. If you want to bow your head where you are, I'm not going to tell you how to pray or when to pray. I'm not your Holy Spirit. But I will encourage you to pray. Because I am your friend. Church, a little bit like I said a minute ago, there will be some that will wholeheartedly embrace uh, this word. And then there will be some that will, you know, it, won't, it will not have meant much to them or changed them or impacted them one way or the other. But my, my prayer and my heart is that it has reached you to the point that you are the one that goes home to your family today. And, and you say, things are going to be different. 
for me, they're going to be different. If you're the dad, the husband, you gather your family together and you say, God has, God has ministered. He has spoken to me. Dad's going to be different. I'm not going to be the same. He's changing me. And that you're the mom that you would say the same thing. As for me and my house. This is the way things are. Because when I've given him my heart, nothing else has it. Is that, is that simple? If I've given him my heart, nothing else has my heart. He has it all. And that becomes my, my passion, my drive, the thing that, that I live for. And it shows up in everything I do. I still work and I still do ordinary things. But it's different. It's for a different reason. And my passion is different. Pray that God would change every family in this church to the degree it needs to be changed. And you would know better than anybody. What is he saying to you in this? I, I hope this, this yields the kind of fruit that, that there are moms and dads that spend a lot more time praying. I hope it brings the kind of fruit that their kids that will say to their parents, whether you serve him with all your heart or not, I have no choice anymore. I've given him my heart. And I'm going to give him everything. And that's going to look like me reading my Bible more because I, I want to know, I want to know more about him. Know more about his nature. What his will. It's going to look like me praying more. It's going to look like me being a little more thoughtful. You're going to see less criticism come out of me. <laughs> You're going to see less, less anger and lashing out. I'm just not going to participate in those things anymore because he's changing me. And I don't want that. I don't like that. When I see it come out of me at times, and I do, we all do. I don't like that. I don't want that there anymore. And he is the master at ridding us of things. If you'll pray that prayer, God change me. God make me like you. He will answer it. He will answer it. Maybe not in the way you thought he would. Maybe not in the way you wanted him to. But he'll answer it and it'll be good. It'll be right. It'll be what was needed. Anybody else? Brother Ken, you got anything you need to say? Okay. All right. You're dismissed. <laughs>